Father, we thank you. We lift you on high again in the name of Jesus. Thank you for this third day in this ministers and leaders conference. And thank you for your blessing, which has been pouring down upon us ever since the first night up till this morning. Receive our thanks in the name of Jesus. Thank you, mighty Father, in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you again for our general overseer, Reverend Sam Abueji, whom you have been using mightily to lead us, not only in this ministers and leaders conference, but the entire church ministry. Receive our thanks for his life in the name of Jesus. And all of the leaders who have been working with him as a team, we thank you for their lives. And we pray that grace will multiply upon each and every one of them in the precious name of Jesus. And Lord, we are set to receive your word again. Open our eyes of understanding. Show us light. Give us understanding. Stir up willingness in our hearts to do your word. Make us productive. By the word we'll be hearing in Jesus' precious name. All the saints of God say a louder amen. amen. Please give God another big hand as you take your seat, please. I want to count it a great honor again this morning for the privilege God has given to me to be in this wonderful conference and I appreciate our general overseer for counting it a thing of honor for me to be here and I want to appreciate every one of you for your warm reception beginning from last night the word of the Lord which he sent me to bring to you your reception towards it it's amazing, and I want to thank God for everyone's life here this morning. May I also quickly congratulate our general overseer for the outcome of the election towards his second tenure, which I believe is ordained by God and endorsed by members of this church and ministry and we pray that God will use him in a greater way than he did in the first tenure. A big congratulations to you, sir, for this um, outcome. We pray that God will continue to increase his grace upon your life and for all of our team, I want to believe that this second tenure is for all of you as you work together as a team, God will keep increasing you more and more. It takes one person to have a vision, but it takes a team for the vision to be realized. I pray that as you work together as a team, far beyond imagination, this vision of the next tenure within the content of the first square gospel church shall be fully realized in Jesus' name. Once again, congratulations. And for your newborn baby or grandbaby, which came up the same day, a big congratulations. To God be the glory forever. In Jesus' name. In our first teaching last night, we emphasized on the necessity of making disciples. It's an area that cannot be overemphasized. Making more disciples is non-optional. It's not if I like to. It is mandatory. Jesus commanded us to do so. Go ye into all nations and teach. Go everywhere. Raise more leaders. Prepare them. Get them set for the task ahead. 
And I want to believe that each and every one of us have taken up the task like we deliberated in that teaching before the year runs out by the grace of God. Each and every one of us will be able to point to disciples that we are making. Did you join me to say another amen to that? How many of us desire that before the year runs out, you'll be able to point to one, two, three, four, five, to ten or more of disciples you are raising? So may I receive the grace for it. Let God hear you, please. Say, I receive the grace for it. It shall be so for you in Jesus' name. In this session, we want to quickly look at the subject of observing the process of making disciples. Observing the process of making disciples. And we'll be concluding it by looking at the traits of a discipler. What are you expected to put in place to be a good discipler? I want to begin by saying that making disciples is a developmental process of turning new converts into disciples. Because a disciple, like we said yesterday, among others, is a follower. So we want to look at four key points in the process. Scientifically, products are outcome of process. Many people run after product when they should follow process. When you follow process, you are sure to get the product in the factory line. The manufacturer is never in a hurry to see his products. He just carefully follows the process. And that's why it's very important for us to follow this process in order for us to have a guaranteed product. In this wise, our product is disciples. But the process must be followed. Now, it begins by going. Jesus said, go. Help me tell you about go. It begins by going. It will interest you to know that Jesus was a goer. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good, preaching and teaching. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. He went from village to towns to cities preaching and teaching. Help me tell your neighbor, you have to go about. Uh -huh. He went about. He went about. He went everywhere. Yesterday, I remarked, I got born again in 1977. 1978, I started going. Going from house to house. Going from village to village. Going everywhere where there are people. So we have to obey the command to go. To go. To go to do what? To look for souls to save. Discipleship begins with winning souls. If a woman does not deliver a child, she cannot nurse a child. She cannot nurture the child that she did not give back to. So it begins with giving back to children. Saving souls. Saving souls. Once a sinner, now disciples of Christ. We have to go. It's mandatory. Without a going, there is no coming back with disciples. He that goeth forth with seed in his hand, with weeping, shall doubtless return 
with singing, with rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves with him. Psalm 126, verse 6, we have to go. Jesus commanded us to go. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Mark 16, 15, all the way to 20. He commanded us to go. Go ye into the world and preach. He that believe and is baptized shall be saved. And this sign shall follow them that believe to go. I don't pray for signs. It's I just go. As I go, the signs will follow me. Science does not flow without a goal. If you want to see the flow of science, you have a duty to go. This sign shall follow them that go. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will lay hands on the sick. They shall be healed. They will speak with tongues unknown. If they take any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And God went with them, walking through them. If you want God to walk through you, you have to go for him. If you want God to be with you, you have to go for him. If you go for him, he will go with you. If you go for him, he will walk through you. Do you know the reason why many churches are no longer seeing signs and wonders? They have stopped going. Those of us who are good Bible scholars, you can take a study of the churches that exist today. The churches that experience signs and wonders continuously are churches who are on the go. They are on the go. They are reaching out to more souls. They are planting more churches. They are blessing more people in the society. We have to go to look for them. How did Jesus find Andrew and Philip and Peter and Nathaniel? He was on the go. Disciples won't come to meet you. You have to go for them. To see sinners saved. That by the grace of God, in my own Christian life, I've been doing for more than 45 years on the go. And I'm not tired of it. Like I mentioned yesterday, between February and March, by the grace of God, I've done six outreaches every Saturday. And when I check my record, God gave us over 600 souls those few weeks cumulatively. And we keep going. We keep going. Our duty is to go. Help me tell your neighbor, your duty is to go. And it doesn't cost much to do that. I don't have to set up crusade equipments to go. There are people are everywhere. Jesus said, go to the highways. If you are tired of the highways, go to the edges. Go to the streets. Go to the lane. Go to the marketplace. Go everywhere and compel them to come. Somebody said, I don't know how to preach. Just go and share your testimonies. Tell them how Jesus has changed your life. We must be on the go because Jesus commanded us to do so. Say with me, I will go. Say with me, I will go. Say it again, I will go. Make that commitment stronger, I will go. I will reach out to souls. Everywhere they are, it's my duty to go on the behalf of Jesus. Receive the grace for it. Receive the grace for it. I say receive the grace for it. What more? There are people who come to you to share with you their problems. It's an opportunity for you to introduce to them Jesus. You go to your mechanic workshop to repair your car. What stops you from talking to the mechanic? Wonderful ladies, you go to the salon. They are treating your hair for one hour and you are wasting the one hour. 
Don't you know you are the master for that moment? Because whosoever you are paying is a servant to you. They are touching your ear. Why can't you open your mouth? To tell them about your Jesus. You go to your fashion designers. They sew good cloth for you. Why can't you tell them, follow me to church this coming Sunday. I want to wear this dress. I want you to see how it looks on my body. Lots of opportunities for us to reach out to people. My wife and I were in an hotel outside the country some months back. And the room maker came to make the room. And as she was making the room, I told my wife I have to share with this woman. She's busy using her, her hand, but her ears are not blocked. As she was walking, I was talking. To the glory of God, she gave her life to Christ. Somebody has to tell somebody. May you be the one that will go and tell others. Now, that's what Jesus commanded us. We don't have power to change people, but we are authorized to talk to them. Whether they are saved or not is not your making. But they cannot be saved without you telling them. It is the Holy Spirit that pricks their heart. But it is you that must do the talking. Peter did the talking. Their hearts were pricked and they gave their lives to Jesus. Say with me again, I will go. I will preach. I will tell them about Jesus. Receive grace for it. I say receive grace for it. In the name of Jesus Christ. We are saved to save others. That's one of the slogans we grew up with in the faith. Because we are ambassadors for Christ. We are reconcilers. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. If a man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. And all things are become new. The following verse tells us. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us. He hath given to us. Say with me, he has given to me. Let me hear you please. He has given to us. What did he give to us? The ministry of reconciliation. It's a ministry to all. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And to summarize it in verse 20, he said, now, Ye are ambassadors of Christ. You are representative of Christ. We are the one that they see. We are the one who tells them what they should do. Help me tell your neighbor, please, you are an ambassador of Christ. Please note also, no matter the title you bear, no matter the calling you claim to have, prophet, Evangelist, apostle, bishop, reverend, pastor, our primary task is to do the work of soul winning. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. Paul admonishing Timothy that he should do the work of evangelism. Do the work, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of evangelism, the work of soul winning, in order to make a full proof of your ministry. No matter the title you carry, if you don't win souls, you are not making a full proof of your ministry. What validates your ministry is soul winning. Soul winning is what validates your ministry. In my view, by my understanding, you are not in ministry if you are not winning souls. You are not in ministry if you are not winning souls. You are not a mother figuratively. You are a mother by demonstration. You can't claim to be a mother if you don't have children. You are a woman, but until you have children, you are not a mother. You are called into ministry but you are not validated, authenticated, without souls being won. You are not a pastor if you are not a soul winner. 
you are not a pastor if you are not a soul winner. Because whosoever does not win soul cannot have value to nurture the soul. Now, all of us know in the society, a woman is different from a mother. You see passion, connection to the child. Mother to child is different from woman to a child. The reason why many pastors carelessly pastor is because they didn't give birth to those children. You can't have a convert and not nurture the convert well. I can tell who a genuine pastor is. By the grace of God, I've been in this thing for a short while. Just a few years I've been pastoring. 37 years. So I know what it means by his grace to be a pastor. The souls won. I started pastoring or pastoral ministry, pastoring four people, including myself. So I knew what it meant to win souls and to keep them. I knew what it meant to go to the field. I didn't meet a ready-made church. Went from street to street, from lane to lane, from corner to corner, ministering to people to see them saved. So tell me how I will show value to them. It will also interest you that soul winning is the main focus of Trinity. God the Father, he sent his son to save souls. John 3, 16, we are all familiar with that. I'm verse 36, Romans 3, 23. Also, Jesus himself, his principal mission was souls. Souls, Matthew 121. He came to save souls. By his name, he was Savior. He declared, I came to save the lost. Matthew 18, 11. Luke 19, 10. He went about. It was God's mission. It was Christ's mission. It was also the mission of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the core reason we are empowered is to win souls. If you are not winning souls, you are wasting power. And if you waste power, God withdraws the power from you. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me. Power is not for merchandising. It's principally for winning souls. He empowered us to win souls. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me. Soul winners are most empowered. Gospel bearers are power carriers. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Unto them that believe. The most concentrated power of God resides with soul winners. And with soul winning church. If we don't want the Holy Ghost to leave our churches, let us go and be winning souls. The easiest way to retain the Holy Ghost is by going for the purpose for which he anointed us. Soul winners, don't beg for more power. Soul winners, don't beg for more power. Power is replenished to them over and over again. Say loud amen. amen. A louder amen. amen. Remember, we are talking about the process for discipleship. And number one is going out to win souls. Number two is following up the souls. Follow up. It's one thing to win souls. It's another thing to see them survive. If you have been in soul winning before, you will realize that the number of souls being won are so many, but the ones that have been sustained are few. And you know the reason why? Jesus gave a parable. He said the kingdom of God is as a man who went and planted his seed. Matthew 13, 24 to 28. He went and planted the seed. When we go to win souls, we are seed sowers. 
we sow seeds into the heart of people. And many times, they genuinely open up. But while men slept, the enemy came and planted tars. We must never make a mistake that once someone is saved, he's forever saved. Satan will go back to plant tars to deter them, to accuse them, to remind them of their old ways, to dissuade them that they cannot make it, to further tempt them. So after you have won the souls, what do you do? You ensure you follow them up, like they say, bumper to bumper. Giving no room to the devil to return back to them. In Acts chapter 15, verse 36, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again. And visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Follow up. Very critical. I remember when I gave my life to Jesus in 1977. The following day or two after, I had somebody came to follow me up to check how I was doing. Because if we don't do that, we give room to the devil. So when I go for outreach, I'm using my personal experience, please bear with me. As soon as I return, within two, three hours, we start calling them. How are you doing? How has it been with you? To follow them up before the enemy will plant tars and pollute their minds. Early in the year, I had a visit to Houston in America, and I met with a soul who gave his life to Jesus. From here, I've been calling him to follow him up. I personally spend a lot on telephone calls, on SMS, reaching out to them, gingering them, quickening them. Now, come with me from the perspective of child delivery. After a woman delivers a child, the next thing is to begin to nurse the child. That's why you see mothers and new babies. Almost every minute, she goes to check the child. How is the temperature? Is the child breathing? Because the rate of mortality, we understand, is very high, either at delivery or close to after delivery, many, many babies die in the process because there is no follow-up. You cannot deliver a child and leave the child without being checked from time to time, from time to time. That's how it is spiritually. When souls are saved, they must be followed up. They must be followed up to ensure that they are established in the faith. So, soul winning is not the end. Soul follow-up is very critical. Are you following up your new converts? Are you spending time? Are you spending money? Ask mothers. It is not cheap to nurse children. Very costly. The drugs you need to buy and other medications. The cloths you need to buy, it's not cheap. Sometimes we have new converts who are living in brothels. How do you take care of them so that they won't go back there? You pay. Two weeks ago, we had to pay for one of our converts. He was living among, you know, uh, harlots. He was genuinely saved. But what can he do? He has no place to sleep. He was tempted to go back there. So we have to pay for him to be rehabilitated. Soul establishment is not cheap. You pay for it. Say loud amen. Just like Lukitapo, physically 
biological born children. We have to pay for it. That's why the church cannot afford to be poor. That's why you as a believer, you cannot afford to be poor. The reason why I teach and believe and receive prosperity is so as to use it to advance the kingdom of God. To advance the kingdom of God. The gospel will be restricted if the church is poor. Let us win souls. Let us follow up the souls until they are fully established. Number three is in gathering of the souls. In gathering. In gathering. That is bringing them to church. Church is not man's idea. It is God's idea. Way back in the Old Testament, it is called Zion. The place of refuge, the place of protection, the place of defense, and the place of blessing. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has died for its habitation. This is my rest forever. God dwells in the church. The church is God's headquarter. Psalm 132 from verses 13 all the way to 18. We cannot play down the church. Don't say there are many fake churches. But how do you prove that there are original churches? If we don't establish one, that's why church planting will continue. Why are we planting churches? So that we can reach out to more people. So that we can be closer to them. We take the church closer. We take the church closer. We take it closer as a temple or as self-fellowship. We plant self-fellowship in houses so that people can easily reach out to the house of God in homes or in the temple. Jesus commanded us to bring them in. Luke 14, 21 and 23. He commanded us to bring them in. He sent his servants. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the street and the lanes of the city I'm bringing either, go and bring them, the poor, the maimed, the old, and the blind. And in verse 23, after his servant said, we have done that, and there is yet more room. And he said unto the servant, go out into the highways and edges, and compare them to come. Why? That my house may be filled. God delights in multitudes of souls that my house may be filled, that my house may be filled, that the local assembly you are pastoring may be filled. Go and bring them. And you know, again, it's costly to bring them. Bring the poor, the ones who don't have money. How will they go? You bring them. You hire vehicles to bring them. You put them on motorcycle to bring them. Go and bring them. Go and bring them. Satan may want to discourage them from trekking. You go and bring them. Somebody say with me, we will go and bring them. Let me hear you very well, please. Say it one more time. That's what he said. Go and bring them. Go and bring them to the house that they might be filled. Why are we bringing them to the house of God? So that they can be fed by the word of God. So that they can learn the way of the Lord. In the first church, they were doing that. Acts chapter 4. I mean, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. After 3,000 people were saved, daily they were teaching them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. See how they were established. Verse 46. Daily they continued. Daily they continued. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, in the temple, in the temple, in the temple. And breaking of bread from house to house, house fellowship. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were praising God, verse 47. And God was with the people with favor. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Number four in the process is where the task is the task of maturing them. The task of maturing them, the task of raising them, 
the task of developing them. We bring them in as babes. We rear them as children, but we raise them as adults. That's where the task is, watching over them. That's when we begin to identify potentials for leadership among the people. That's when we begin to invest in disciples' classes. That's when we continue in our churches to teach people what is relevant to their development. Church is not a place where we just get people excited. It's a place where we get people educated. I have discovered one of the things missing in the church of today is enlightenment. Education. Teaching the doctrines of Christ. Showing to people how they can be strong in the faith. Not flamboyancy teaching that gets people to just shout and shake and at the end of the service, they ask themselves, after this service, what next? I consider myself a failure. If after the service, somebody stands up and says, I don't even know what to do. I should be blamed for it. Because it's given to me to teach them what they should do. The greatest responsibility of pastors and leaders is to enlighten members, enlighten men. Show them the word of God as raw as it is. To preach and teach in season and out of season. To show to people their rights in redemption and their responsibility in Christ. Jesus said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this is the way to it. Come and learn of me. Come and learn of me. Church is not a place for show. Church is a place for learning. Church is spiritual education center. That's why pastors, you can't afford to be lazy. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The friendship between pastor and congregation is the word of God. The pasture. Is what makes you a pastor. The pasture that you present to the sheep is what makes you a pastor to the sheep. Without pasture, they will leave you and go and look for it elsewhere. People come to church hungry and the pastor is lazy, shouting from one end of the altar to the other. Come and shout, yeah! at you what a dramatist this pastor is. What a dramatist. I see many pastors with big wardrobe, but with very lean library. Pursuing after things instead of pursuing after God. People won't follow you if you don't have what is worth following. Growing up among young people, in ministry, I used to know one or two pastors who were together then. Every money he has, buy perfume, buy coat, designer's wear, designer shoe, designer cream, designer everything. At that time, my salary was 230 naira. 230 naira. Not 230,000. 230. I bought one Bible one day. 96 naira, 90 kobo, out of 230. That was when this four parallel Bible came out. I went and bought it. You can calculate the percentage of that money from 230 naira. Designer shoe has worn out. Designer coat has worn out. But the word of God inside me is renewed every day. I don't look for those things again. I don't look for coats by way of sharing this humble testimony, the last more than 25 years, I've not bought coat for myself, or shoe, or wristwatch, or shirt, or tie. How do I get them? I get them from the blessing of the Lord, 
whom I seek on daily basis, whom I serve on daily basis. I go to win souls. People pursue me. A few weeks ago, I was on the field preaching. And somebody I never knew before came and met me. He said, the Lord lay on my heart to give you a seed. How much? 200,000 naira. God told me that's for, for your lunch. Just going for him. Pursuing after him. Doing his will. Developing spiritually. Stop struggling. You are not called to struggle. You are called to make a mark. Say a loud amen. A louder amen. amen. I didn't say it's a sin to buy koto. You should buy. Because you need to look presentable. But I'm telling you how God is providing for me because I'm pursuing after his purpose. I spend to get books. I spend to acquire knowledge. So you can rightly divide the word of truth. Paul told Timothy, until I come, give attendance to reading. There are many pastors and leaders who have not read one book the last one year. And you expect to feed the people? It's not possible. I read every day. I write every day. I nurture myself, not looking for what to preach, but what to enrich myself with. And when you are enriched, it will show. When you are loaded, you will offload. When you have light, you will shine. For people to come to your light. He said the Gentiles shall come to your light. But if you don't have the light, they will not come to it. You need to generate the light, the light, the word of God. You need to sit down and study so you can rightly divide the word of truth. Somebody say loud amen. amen. A louder amen please. Amen. Pastors, leaders, please don't be lazy. What business as a pastor? Watching football on Saturday, 10 p.m. You will be in church the following morning on Sunday. And he's watching football. What is the happiness that he's committed to his duty, to his task? If you don't have it, you cannot give it. So may I receive the grace. Say it again, I receive the grace. It's getting colder. I hope I'm not hitting you too hard. Say I receive the grace. Say I receive the grace. In Jesus' name, it is yours. Amen. May I conclude by presenting to us what are the traits of a discipler? What does it take to be a good discipler? If you like, to be a leader. What does it take? For people to follow you, what does it take for you to be attracted to disciples because if you don't carry the attraction you cannot draw them close to you what does it take to be a magnet that can attract iron if you are not admirable you cannot attract followership what is it that excites people to come to listen to you what must you do to make people to come to you? Because they were coming to Jesus. They were coming to him. They pressed on him to hear the word. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. They pressed on him. In most cases, when he enters a house, the house is so filled to the overflow. What is it that was attracting people to Jesus? That's what we are looking at. So that on your side, you can be a good leader, a good portrait that people will like to follow. Principally, be exemplary. Example is the hardest thing to do in leadership. Example, example. Of the things with Jesus, both began to do and to preach. Be a doer. Be a doer. In churches, I've been privileged to pastor. People go for evangelism because they see me in the forefront going. Don't teach what you don't do. Otherwise, you become a mockery among the people. 
Don't tell people to give if you are not a giver. Don't tell people to pray if you are not praying. Be a doer. Show to people practically. Let them see what you preach in your life. People don't follow us for what we preach. They follow us for what we do. Listen to this. You may be applauded for what you say. And we have many like that today. You may be applauded for what you say, but you will not be followed except by what you do. There are many popular, many popular people, especially among the pastors, many popular pastors who lack followers. Never mistake applause for approval. Never. Never mistake applause for approval. People may have different reasons why they are applauding you. They may applaud you for speaking good grammar. They may applaud you for appearing in a very good dress. But they will not wish that they follow you. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Paul told Timothy, be thou an example. He said, let no man despise your youth, but be thou an example of believers, of new converts, of disciples. Remember, disciples means, you know, means emulation. Somebody in front of you, you want to be like. So you have to be an example. If you don't want them to look down on you, be an example. Followers look up to examples. Jesus showed them what to do. He lived in front of them, naked, open, nothing to hide. This is where we are missing it most times. I want to repeat it again. Your number one teaching is not with words, but with your lifestyle. Your lifestyle. Show love to people. It will amaze you how they will follow you. You don't have to be as eloquent. You only have to be exemplary. Be exemplary. Don't cover your poor example with your eloquence. Therefore, a leader is one in front as pattern to follow. Somebody say with me, please, pattern to follow. I want to hear you well, please. Who must a leader be? Pattern to follow. It must be reference to make. It must be one people can make reference to. Image to attract. Object to motivate others. To motivate people without forcing them. There are leaders who want to enforce themselves on people. And there are leaders that people willingly follow. You see, when you lead by example, people willingly follow you. They willingly follow you. They want to be like you. A leader must be a voice to hearken to. He must be a person of influence. A personality that people draw close to. People go to look for him. When you live by example, you don't go to look for people and solicit followership. People love to follow you. You must be a figure of encouragement. That's a core trait of a discipler who will disciple others to follow. Number two, let's quickly run through it. He must be a teacher. A teacher. He must be an instructor. He must be a guide. He must be one who can put people along the right path of life. And like I said earlier, if you are not enlightened, you cannot become light. You get enlightened, you are an enlightener. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach. Look at that. Apt to teach. Apt to teach. 
He must be one who has given himself to broad study of the word of God. I do quite a lot of extensive study. I study management. I study administration. I study human relations. I study different things that will help me to raise more people around me. It's not just reading the Bible, but reading the books that makes reference to the Bible. If all you know is just the Bible, you are limited. Because you need to know the Bible with relevance. You need to know the Bible in this contemporary world on how, because that will help you to relate well with the people of this age. You must be apt to teach. Attitude is not a substitute to aptitude. Character is not a substitute to charisma. Anointing is not a substitute to knowledge. They must go together. Apt to teach. You must be knowledgeable. You must be able to capture issues in a way that our contemporary generation will be able to understand what you are saying. The way we preach 20 years ago is not the way we preach today. If you don't know how to relate with the new and next generation, they will leave you. Update your knowledge if you don't want to become outdated in relevance. The world is a moving world and you have to be updated in knowledge to catch up with the movement. When the beat of music changes and you don't change your dancing steps, you'll be odd in the society. You need to know when to change your steps of dancing. When the beat of music changes, otherwise you find yourself missing your leg, missing your step, and people will, ah, this one, he has missed it. You will not miss out. I said you will not miss out. You must be a teacher. Number three, very importantly, a discipler must be a listener. He must be a listener. You see, we don't only lead with our eyes and with our mouth. We lead with our ears. I have discovered most successful leaders are listeners. Jesus was a listener. Luke 2.46. He sat among the lawyers and the doctors, both hearing, hearing, and asking, Speaking begins with hearing. I used to ask people, and listen to me, will you wonder why God gave you one mouth and two ears? So you can listen more before you say what you have to say. If you are not a good listener, you will be a poor speaker. Fools are known by their words, their mouth, but the wise is known by his ears. A wise man will hear. Jesus was a listener. One day, he called the disciples to listen to them. Who do men say I am? Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 17. Who do men say I am? And he listened to them. The first person said his own. Second person said his own. The third person, he said, but who do you say I am? And Peter said, hey, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he was excited. One way to destroy hypocrisy is to listen to your upcoming disciples. Listen to your new converts. In my young pastorate, a young man came and met me. He said, sir, I've given my life to Christ, but I still find myself drinking and smoking. What do I do? I listen to him. I didn't condemn him. Today we have leaders who condemn people. You, you, you. Four years I've been following you up. You are still drinking? You go to hell. Hell, hell fire is waiting for you. You say, yes, sir. I'm ready to go for it. <laughs> you must be a listener. Listening connects you to people's hearts. That's why 
when you go to a place and you speak to your leader, he listens to you, the fact that he listens to you excites you. As leaders, raising more leaders, listen to people behind you. Even if you won't do everything they say, listen to them. Commend them for opening up to you. You know the reason why we have hypocrisy a lot in the church today is because we don't allow people to speak. We don't allow our followers to bear their mind. Let them be free. Even if it's in error, let them be free to bear their mind. Be a listener. Be a listener. Jesus was. If you check the Old Testament, David was a listener. He had prophet. He had counselors. Solomon was not a listener. Even though he encouraged people to listen. A time came, he had no counselor. Otherwise, how could somebody be married 700 wives? Nobody to counsel him. He was the all-wise person. All wise. Give room to your converts. When that man told me he has been drinking and sick, I said, he asked me, what do I do? I knew if I told them certain things, it would sound doctrinal that would make him to be behaving in an hypocritical way. So I told him, keep coming to church. Keep hearing the word. Keep being in fellowship. A few weeks after he came back, he said, sir, I didn't know when I stopped drinking and smoking again. If I didn't listen to him, I would have lost him. I would have lost him. Be a listener. So also it is in your homes. Listen to your children. Don't shut down your children when they want to speak. Don't ask them, what do you know? Before I married your mother, where, where were you? I'm talking, you are talking. I'm talking, you are talking. Nonsense. Clear off. Uh, thank you, daddy. I'll see you again. I will see you again means I'm gone. Today, by the grace of God, our children want my view over virtually everything they want to do. Why? I listen to them. Even when they speak in error, I listen to them. Let them pour out their mind. Be sincere about what they are saying so I can have room to correct them and to guide them. We are driving young people away from the church because we don't care to listen to them. We want to impose things on them. So they react and find their way out. Now listen to me. There's a difference between communication and conversation. Conversation creates atmosphere of liberty for people particularly behind you and under you to express themselves. So you can have opportunity to bring in correction and guidance. Don't tell your children, this is what you must do. Final. Don't tell them, in our days, when our father speak, nobody must speak. In your days, not their days. When you listen to people, they get freer to tell you the challenges they are facing the difficulty they are facing. Don't be hard-looking leader. Be one that they can find freedom to express themselves to. Is somebody getting something here? If you are so, man, thank you, Jesus. Number four, be compassionate. Be compassionate. Be compassionate. Jesus was compassionate. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. He was compassionate. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. He was compassionate. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He was compassionate. Compassion was the trait that Jesus used to draw people to himself. In John chapter 1, verses 36 to 59, you see compassion over everyone that came to him. What does it mean to be compassionate? It means to be reachable by people, to be touchable by people, to be offendable. Peter and others offended him. He didn't throw them away. To be caring, to be affectionate. See, there are people that when you come close to them, they feel you. 
It's not just enough for people to come close to you. They should feel you. They should feel that your heart is with them. Despite their errors. Just like mothers, they relate with their children in the manner that the children can feel their love, feel their compassion. We must be caring. Jesus was at the grave of Lazarus. When Mary and Martha came and met him, and Jesus wept. Jesus wept. In my understanding, real leaders weep to identify with the pain of their followers. They weep. I weep occasionally. When I see the pain some people go through, I weep. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of identification. It's a sign of linkage. It's a sign of we are together. You need to create a feeling for people you are leading. A feeling. Compassion. Jesus wept. And the following verse, the people said, See how he loved them. Compassion means love that can be noticed, love that can be felt. Feelable love, touchable love, love. Love that finds solution, not love that discusses, love that is practical in meeting the needs of people. There are things you do for disciples that they can never forget you for. They can never forget you. It's not volume. Somebody is hungry among your disciples and you took some mood of rice to him. He has lost his hope. But here you are, out of compassion. You are able to meet the needs. Number four trait of a disciple, of a leader, is humility. Humility. Humility means coming to the level of others, not overestimating yourself. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4. Correct estimation of yourself. You are not looking at yourself as a big man. Look not every man on his things. No. Don't overestimate yourself. Sometimes people ask me, you mean somebody of your level can come to this place? I said, why not? Because I go to different places. Show me where people are. I will go there to preach. I go to all kinds of places. To shanties, to lungus, everywhere. Just take me there. As long as there are souls to be saved. Don't carry yourself as superior to others. It's only the privilege you have. It's only the privilege you have. The G.O. and his wife and myself were discussing this morning. And I said, do you know the reason why God called you and I? He called us because we are fools. I'm a fool. That's why he called me. I'm not wise. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. He said, your calling is not according to the wisdom of this world. He said, but God has chosen the foolish things to despise those who are wise. He called me because I'm a weak man. I'm not a strong man. No. I tell people, don't call me a strong man. I'm an enabled weak man. Enabled by his grace. I'm not better than any of you seated here. No. It's only a privilege. It's only an opportunity. I'm not superior to any. So to go down to the level of others like Jesus did is what we must do. Let's go down to the level. You see somebody falling, go to his level. Somebody is falling into sin, go to his level. Identify with him. Jesus did so. He went and preached among harlots. He preached among drunkards, even though he did not participate. Neither did he dress like them. He was still decent, but he identified with them in spirit and in soul. Say loud, amen. amen. Number six, quickly, patience. Patience. Process demands patience. Permit me to repeat that again, please. Process demands 
patient. If you are not patient, you cannot follow process. And if you don't follow process, you cannot see product. Be patient with people. Identify potentials to motivate your patience. Jesus was patient with Peter. He was patient with Thomas, who looked too slow. He was patient with them. You see, one of the things Satan uses to discourage leaders from raising others is impatient. We are too much in the hurry. You mean you can't change? How many times will I correct you? Nonsense. Stupid. Correcting you every day. Every day. Even you. Didn't they correct you every day? Second Timothy chapter 2 again, verses 24 and 25. You must be patient. A leader must be patient. If you want to raise disciples, you must be patient. He said, patient. You must be patient. And finally, you must be gentle. Gentle. Gentility means soft touch. Soft touch. Soft utterance. Being tough, but not rough. Not rough in your approach to issues, although tough. Good mothers are tough, but not necessarily rough. Good mothers. That's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Paul referred to himself as a nurse. He said, we're among you as nurse to tender you. Gentleness means tender-heartedness. Correcting people, but with good intention that they will change. Patient. Gentle. Do you say because a child falls, you should condemn the child? No. You tenderly bring up the child. You encourage the child. You can make it. You can do it. You will do better. I know you'll be a great child. If your child comes back from school at the end of the term and he takes number two position from the back, don't hit the head of the child. Call the child to a corner and tell the child, I know you are more than this. This paper is not you. It's the teacher's appraiser. God gave you to me to be a precious child. I know you will do well. I know you will do better. Look, that child will sleep so well that night with a determination that I am going to make my mother proud. I'm going to make my father proud. We are quick to condemn people. That's why they are not rising. The natural man is quick to condemn others. Forgetting that he also is full of errors. That's why we must be compassionate. We must be tender. We must be gentle. So as to help others up. I never had my father related with me as a failure. He encouraged me I could do things. And here I am I today doing things. As a leader, as a teacher, as a pastor, encourage people around you. Let them feel you. Show them compassion. When they fail, identify with their failure. Don't make them go to sleep with confusion in their head. Waking up with determination that they will not follow Jesus again. Listen to this testimony. About three Saturdays ago, we went to preach somewhere. And we met a young man who said, he said, I have divorced Jesus a long time ago. He was very sincere. And we listened to him. What did you mean? Not arguing with him. And he explained. He used to have two cars. He was doing well in his cosmetic business. Suddenly everything went down. And he thought it is Jesus he could blame for it. So we encouraged him. He was in the choir. We encouraged him. You can make it again. You can make it again. And one of us who went with me gave him little money. And that money was life to him. No food to eat. He came to church the following day. Boisterous. Excited. If you are not patient with people, you cannot raise people. If you are not gentle and tender to people, you cannot help people. 
Don't be quick to condemn people. People are going through things. Including leaders amongst us. The people in your team of leadership, you need to be sensitive. Jesus was sensitive to his disciples. One day, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Jesus went there. Maybe he saw that that day, Peter's performance was low. And I perceive he asked him, Peter, what's happening? And Peter said, my mother-in-law is sick. Let's go there. Let's identify with people's need. Let's make people know that we are together in the challenges they are going through. That's how to raise people. Humorously, discussing this morning with our GO, I said, if the GO asked me to come now, I have to. If for nothing, on the account of our old time relationship. That's how it should be. We are together. You are not alone. I'm not alone. I know what you are going through. I will stand with you. That's how to make people stand as our disciples. I want to believe that this short words is a blessing to you. Go, therefore, and make more disciples. Rise to your feet, please. Go and make more disciples. Go and make more disciples. Remember, our number three objective for all these teachings is to receive grace. And grace comes via the word of God. So when you receive the word, you are taking capsules of grace. By the word you have heard, grace is already released upon you. I said grace is already released upon you. Therefore, lift up your voice and begin to declare, God, I go to put this word to work. And all the words that I've been hearing, since ever this conference began, somebody pray right now. Pray. Raise your voice. Raise your voice. Turn. Release the grace. Lose the grace via your prayer. Pray to release the grace. Pray to release the grace. Somebody raise your voice and pray. Pray very well. Pray very hard. Pray loudly. Pray strongly. Pray with audacity. I'm going from here to make more disciples for Jesus. Everyone around me must become a disciple. Everyone behind me must become a disciple. A true disciple of Christ. I am going to be making more disciples patiently. Somebody pray. Perhaps you need more grace for patience. Receive it. Receive it. The fruit of the Spirit. I receive tenderness. I receive gentleness. I receive grace to live an exemplary life. To be a good example. Everywhere I go to. Everywhere I stand. Example in words. Example in appearance. Example in behavior. Example in encouragement of others. I receive it, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, we are praying. Somebody say very loud, Amen. Once again, I count it a very great privilege and honor given to me by our GO to be allowed to speak in this conference. It's been a great delight. And we pray that grace will multiply as the conference continues. The unction will not reduce. Revelation will multiply. And we will continue to enjoy the grace of God that's upon this church, upon our GO, and upon all of our leaders. There shall be a replication of the same thing happening here in all of our churches across the nation and even beyond. And somebody join me to say very loud, Amen. This church will continue to grow in leaps and bounds. This church will continue to make greater impact. Our GO receives fresh unction to continue to take the lead effectually in the name of Jesus. Finally, I feel led under one minute to pray for everyone. Put your hand on your body, wherever you are. Is there anyone sick here? I command that sickness to disappear from you right now. When next you go for your checkup, they will tell you it is no longer there. I decree total healing for you. For you and your spouse and members of your family, every issue of concern is taken away from you. I call you blessed. I decree your reward for your labors. In the name of Jesus, be blessed. And I declare you so. In Jesus' precious name. Wave your hand and give glory to Jesus, everybody.